about some work we've been doing here on the coast. Uh, I want to mention um, Tommy from ODFW and also a colleague, Eric White, from Forest Service. ODFW is the main funder of this project. The Forest Service uh, pitched in some additional funding. And so you see what we're talking about, both marine and forest reserves. So as you heard uh, my background, I'm a social scientist and kind of a generalist social scientist. Uh, and we'll talk about sort of some, um, a couple different tools from economics and, and what I would say is placed primarily in, in psychology today. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my uh, focus today is on uh, marine and forest reserves and specifically looking at heterogeneity in terms of preferences for and the well-being impacts of and we'll talk more about what that means as, as we continue here. Uh, so just as a kind of recap, I was here three years ago in the series and spoke about um, we did some previous survey work uh, funded by Sea Grant, just a pilot project looking at community resilience and well-being in that context. So this is, you know, has some overlap with that uh, presentation a few years back, but focused more specifically on reserves. And we added some, this choice experiment context uh, content to the survey. And it's also a coastwide general population survey as opposed to a pilot in a handful of communities. So you'll all be familiar with the um, marine reserves here in Oregon. They are state managed uh, and they are a primary focus of the, the survey and what I'll talk to you about today. As mentioned, we also covered forest reserves and these are specifically federally managed areas that are congressionally designated wilderness or other areas uh, that are withdrawn from uh, resource extraction. So we followed uh, Brian Garbrianz did his uh, PhD um, back at OSU uh, a couple decades ago, I guess. Um, and uh, he did some work that was related, focused on forest reserves. And so we just used his conception of forest reserves for the purpose of this, of this project. So I'll talk about preference, what, you know, the, the kind of simplest um, kind of sense of preference is, would you support or oppose or do, would you like to have uh, expanded or reduced area uh, designated as forest reserves and marine reserves. So we asked that kind of simple question uh, in this survey and I'll, I'll come to um, the methods of the, the survey administration in, in a few slides, but first a little background in terms of the, the content that we're covering. It has some screen, screenshots from the survey. Uh, so this is how we frame the question. Basically, we'd like you to know, I would like to know what your preferences are as coast residents with respect to marine reserves and forest reserves. So just a simple uh, five-point scale gives us some, some general thought and preference. But the, uh, kind of the more kind of meaty part of it is what's known as a choice experiment. And this is a tool that comes out of non-market valuation uh, and specifically a state of preference tool. So economists prefer um, to assess the value that people place on goods and services based on market transactions. But for a lot of goods and services, there aren't market transactions. And so economists rely on a kind of a suite of stated preference tools. Choice experiment is one of those tools. Contingent valuation is another one of the, the common tools that you may have heard about. Choice experiment can provide some perspective on preferences and can be used to, to calculate uh, willingness to pay. So you can look at willingness to pay for an expansion or a reduction in marine reserves or any other attribute that you include in the choice experiment. I'll speak next about um, uh, subjective well-being, which is a newer uh, approach. So there's a strong history of state of preference going back a few decades now um, in the economics uh, literature. Uh, subjective well-being is a newer approach, and so it's a little more exploratory. But in the context of choice experiments, there have been some studies looking specifically on marine areas. They're used to value lots of goods and services. Um, uh, marine protected areas, marine reserves. I'll uh, use marine protected areas in a broad sense and, and likewise marine reserve without getting into the technical details at the moment. Um, in any case, so a couple studies that have been done that are relevant to what we did here in Oregon. Uh, Walbo and Kosaka, um, a couple years back, they surveyed um, residents along the West Coast, all three states, and asked about their preference for marine protected area size, access and utilization using a choice experiment approach. Another study that Wommel did with a, a colleague a few years previous, this was focused in the northeast of the US. And it's of interest here because they focused in that study specifically on preference heterogeneity, the idea that people's preferences for marine reserves and marine protected areas may vary. So some people may be in favor and some people may be opposed. 
They use um, what's known as a latent class model to evaluate that. They have three different classes. And so the basic idea there is that the, the preferences and trade-offs people are willing to make may vary. There may be three kind of groups of people within the region, um, and they may have different preferences. And, and they did find that some respondents, or in, in some cases, you know, one of the classes, um, people preferred larger marine protected areas, and other respondents from a different class, people preferred smaller um, marine protected areas. So what does it look like in terms of what's actually asked in the survey? Uh, so this is a page from the survey. We had a survey both uh, in paper format and in online format. This is a screenshot of the paper version. We have an introduction to the task, just some background. We, we talk about four different attributes. And so in a choice experiment, there are attributes that are presented to respondents. And we describe what those are. So the area of uh, allocated to marine reserves, we provide the baseline, which is about 9% of the um, Oregon Territorial Sea. Forest reserves, about 10% fall into that um, you know, conception of forest reserves, following the Garbriant study. Uh, cost, that allows one to estimate one is to pay if one's interested in doing that. So it's a, a common attribute in choice experiment studies. And then jobs. In this case, we combined uh, both uh, seafood and uh, fishing and, and, and timber jobs in kind of a broad conception. We provide some information there about salary information, for example. So it's not just the number of jobs, but it's the quality of the jobs in terms of, of income. Introduced the, the task there, and then um, presented the choice. And so um, would the respondent, the person receiving the survey, would they prefer the current situation, option one, or option two? And the options, bless you, are defined in terms of the attributes and specifically levels that vary across the different choices. It's common in choice experiments for respondents to face multiple of these, multiple uh, choices or, or tasks. In this one, we just had one. So we had uh, each person just was faced with, with one choice. And they indicated below whether they prefer the current situation, option one or option two, and then also provide some indication of their certainty. So this was a cognitively demanding task, potentially. Uh, people may not have well-formed preferences. Uh, so we, we hope that they'll take the time to think it through and. Uh, and take the, the task seriously. But we recognize that there may be some uncertainty and it's good for us to know that in case we want to use that information to, to um, sort of weight the data or, or otherwise uh, adjust for that. As I mentioned, the, uh, at the choice experiment, is kind of the, the core of it is, um, are the attributes. We have four attributes in this study. Marine reserve area, forest reserve area, cost, and jobs. And these are the different possible levels for each of those. So a 50% decrease, a 50% increase, or no change for each of the reserve types. Cost uh, range from no additional cost up to additional $500 per household per year uh, cost. And jobs, and that could range from no change to a potential loss of jobs. One of the challenges is that in choice experiments, these should all move independently, so that we have multiple different versions of the choice. They're presented at random to different respondents. And across all the respondents, um, by these being independent, statistically, we can identify um, people's trade-offs between the different attributes. So basically, how much are they willing to pay for additional um, marine reserve area or reduced marine reserve area? The challenge is to think of these being independent. So when we talk about uh, jobs, people um, often thought, well, you know, the jobs depend on the area of the marine reserves and the forest reserves. So we try to, in our introduction, try to um, make those separate in people's minds so they can envision a situation where jobs would move in a way that they didn't expect relative to the marine reserves and forest reserves. So that's the context of a uh, choice experiment. Um, I think we're, I'm sure we'll have some Q&A at, at the end, but I'm also happy to ask, uh, answer any questions if you have them as we go along here. Subjective well-being. So this is a, a newer concept, a newer field. Uh, choice experiments, again, have uh, been around for a few decades now. Uh, subjective well-being is, a, is a, a newer approach. The basic idea is that uh, well-being, and specifically subjective well-being, so how we evaluate our well-being, is how people experience and evaluate their lives in general and specific domains. And those domains could be things like social relationships or financial health or physical health or mental health, anything of that sort. Uh, 
Uh, there's been a lot of interest in using subjective well-being as a way to inform policy. So historically, um, there have been statistical indicators, things like GDP um, and various other economic and non-economic indicators that um, policymakers have tracked. And the concept here is that well-being should be uh, one of those indicators, should be added to that kind of suite of indicators. And there was a, a study commissioned by the government of France a few years back, uh, a couple um, Nobel laureates in economics um, that led that effort. And they basically said, yeah, we need to expand the considerations or the metrics that we're using to think about how we track progress in society with well-being, subjective well-being being one, uh, one way to expand that. There are a few different ways to uh, think about well-being. Uh, one is this satisfaction with life or evaluative subjective well-being. And so that can be a satisfaction with life overall or specific domains. Again, things like mental health, physical health, relationships, and what have you. Second is eudaimonic. So that's this idea of flourishing or sense of purpose in one's life. And the last one is uh, affect. So what you know, it's kind of happiness at a moment in time or sadness or uh, different kind of emotions at a particular point in time. Our focus in this study was evaluative because that suited itself to, the, to what we were trying to assess here. When people think about how uh, an evaluation or evaluation object um, could be assessed with respect to well-being, the kind of traditional approach, which I think of, you know, broadly, I kind of broadly think of as a parallel to revealed preference in non-market evaluation, um, as comparison to stated preference, which is, will come to next in the well-being context. The basic idea here is that um, you ask people um, what their current well-being is, and this is done a lot less so in the U.S. Gallup does these types of surveys pretty regularly, but it's much more common in Europe. So they have very good data in Europe in terms of well-being across um, individuals within society. So they do social surveys periodically, ask about well-being, and ask about a bunch of different um, other factors. And the idea is you can um, regress well-being on each relevant predictor, and that could be individual level predictors or broader societal predictors, and that can include predictors reflecting ecosystem services. So it could be sort of a recreation land, uh, access to a natural area, so you can model proximity to a natural area and see where they're not cross-sectionally and or longitudinally, that helps predict well-being. And you get an idea of the contribution um, uh, of that particular uh, factor and predictor uh, to well-being. The challenge is there's not a lot of uh, data on subjective well-being um, outside of some regions and especially down to a small spatial scale. And so in the U.S., again, there's not a lot of good data um, that's, that is regularly collected, so secondary data to, do, to use for this type of analysis. And the challenge, too, is finding good data on relevant predictors. And so, you know, one could think about um, geographic proximity to a protected area. Um, having some relevance with respect to recreation access. Um, but again, sometimes there's limitations in terms of the available data to be able to do this analysis. And of course, it's a correlative type of analysis. So there's always some uncertainty. You know, is a variation in well-being due to that particular predictor or perhaps something else that was not measured in the analysis? This leads us to the direct methods. Uh, and the idea here is to say um, where we could either retrospectively ask how well-being has changed as a result of something that is specified in a scenario or in the, in the survey task, or prospectively. So if this or that happened, how would that affect your well-being? And so I think of this as contingent subjective well-being. So contingent on this scenario or vignette occurring, what would your well-being be and how does that compared to your current well-being. So there's been some recent uh, work uh, uh, in the last several years um, by an economist, Benjamin, who was at um, Cornell, I think he's now at USC. Let's see. Uh, he did a, had a bunch of studies in American Economic Review um, looking at subjective well-being. And one of them was uh, looking at people's residency choices. So if you're a medical student, and you go to a residency, uh, he evaluated the choices people made and compared them to their anticipated well-being in those different residency programs. 
And he found that there was concordance, a, a, a similarity in between their choice and anticipated subjective well-being. But it was um, not perfect. There were also some differences. So their general conclusion was, you know, there is some commonality between choices and well-being, or you can think of choices being made on the basis of well-being. And that's part of what we um, looked at today uh, in, in this particular study is, you know, we, we have choices and we have reported well-being. Do they move kind of in the same direction? Do they tell you similar kinds of information? There are concerns with the indirect approach that I previously mentioned, but also concerns with this direct approach. And some of these overlap with concerns about stated preference techniques um, that are used in non-market valuation. So one is we as humans may tend to underestimate how much we would adapt to a new situation. So if we present a change in a scenario, we may misjudge how well we would adapt to those changes. And that may lead us to overstate the subjective well-being effects. Focus and illusion, if we're presented a scenario, we may focus specifically on whatever is in that scenario and forget everything else that affects our well-being. If we're asked to look into the future and say, you know, how would your well-being be sometime in the future as a result of these changes, we not, may not be able to accurately predict our future tastes and preferences, which may affect how that physical change or objective change affects our, our well-being. And there may also be this idea that how we think about an object really reflects a transition to this new state rather than being in the state itself. So we are thinking about how our well-being may be changed as we go from the current situation to the changes envisioned in the scenario rather than kind of a long-term how would we, uh, what would be our well-being given this new um, state of reality. So again, some of these concerns are similar to state of preference, and some of the folks that have concerns about the well-being approach um, also have concerns about state of preference, which is fairly widely used. Um, and so I think that's important to keep that in mind. And I view this approach very much as exploratory, so I was happy to implement it in this, in this context um, as a way to think through it and, and evaluate that particular approach. But again, we want to make sure that we convey this as an exploratory uh, method. What does it look like? So on the left here, top left, this is what I showed previously in terms of the choice experiment. This is the well-being content. So we ask, what is your current well-being, specifically your life satisfaction overall, and then satisfaction with specific aspects of your life, financial situation, your job situation if you're employed, recreation opportunities, quality of the natural environment, the community and its culture. Then we presented the same information as we did in the choice experiment. So option one in the lower right here, this is just a repeat of option one from the choice experiment and ask people to evaluate that with respect to um, whether it would change their well-being, if at all. So would it, would it, it decrease, have no effect or increase um, your life overall satisfaction considering all aspects? And if it would change, what would be your new well-being number? So if you said it was 80, for example, um, and you said it might increase well-being, then maybe your new well-being would be 83 out of, on a scale of 0 to 100. So the choice experiment can be cognitively difficult. You can imagine that this can be even more difficult. It probably is not too difficult to identify an ordinal change. Would it increase or decrease my well-being? But to actually put a new number on it, that can be challenging. And because of that, for, for the analysis that we're um, talking about today, um, we're just going to focus on this ordinal change. So what direction and, and kind of course magnitude would the change be um, without worrying about the, the detailed number here in terms of the specific interval units between current well-being and new well-being. So we have some covariates. Um, as I mentioned, we wanted to look at um, some heterogeneity. How might uh, the preferences vary across groups within uh, society as well as the well-being effects? So we asked um, respondents to consider the current marine reserves and you evaluate uh, five different aspects of them on a scale of very negative to very positive with the possibility that um, respondents were just not affected one way or the other by marine reserves. So reduced opportunities for commercial charter fishing, including shellfish, was that very negative, very positive, or, or neutral? Opportunities for recreational fishing, um, conservation of the marine environment, change in community jobs and income, and change in the character of the community. 
So folks um, uh, responded across these five different items, and we just took the mean of these five items to come up with a, a single measure of evaluation. We also asked about recreational use. So um, kind of one of the first questions in the, in the survey was, how often do you engage in each of these five different sets of activities anywhere on the coast, and then specifically in the marine area reserve, marine reserve areas? And we had a map showing where those marine reserves were. Uh, and that included also the designation within the marine reserve, so marine protected area, marine reserve, and what was allowed and not allowed in each of those areas. So I grouped them in terms of uh, coastal oriented activities. And that would be things like sightseeing, wildlife viewing, photography, and so on. Beach walking, exploring tide pools. So that'd be more the coast oriented and then the ocean oriented, which would be recreational fishing. Um, and then also ocean swimming, kayaking, surfing, and, and so on. We also asked people um, about their employment. We had different recreation or employment categories here, and people self-selected. So um, this was not a major focus of the survey, so we didn't go into a lot of details, and we didn't provide you know, Oregon Employment Department definitions of these different categories. So this was self-identification in different categories of employment. We asked people to check the box for their primary job, and then also boxes if they're, um, that represented additional income in the household, maybe a second job for the respondent, or somebody else in the household was uh, receiving income through these areas. And the fishing employment uh, variable, which is just a dummy variable, um, would be one if someone was involved in commercial or charter fishing as primary or other fishing related employment. Then we also wanted to get a sense of um, environmental worldview and to see if that might have some bearing on people's preferences and uh, the well-being effects of these scenarios. A common scale that's used for environmental attitude is the new ecological paradigm, but I've not been a huge fan of it uh, for various reasons. Um, and, and I think it does not very well suited to this particular context. So instead we worked with a couple other um, scales. One is this connectedness to nature scale. And the other is a scale that includes some items from the literature as well as some that we developed, which we call anthropocentrism. So we can kind of think of um, people being on the kind of anthropocentric, ecocentric scale. Anthropocentric is kind of the Teddy Roosevelt, Gifford Pinchot kind of uh, perspective. And the more ecocentric might be kind of a John Muir type of perspective. The way attitudes are me uh, measured ideally is to have several statements. In this case, five statements for each and respondents indicate their level of agreement or disagreement on those statements. So that'd be a, uh, it's known as a Likert scale. And this is from the literature, connectedness to nature. It gives you some idea, as the name suggests, and one's connectedness to nature. Um, but I don't think it captures kind of everything. That's kind of one dimension of environmental worldview. And I think that anthropocentrism um, provides a nice kind of second dimension. So, that, um, so we took these two, uh, scales, uh, combine them together basically, so we had the 10 items, and we ran a k-means cluster analysis and, and ended up with five different clusters. So people, some people were in the moderate sort of base cluster for the analysis, others were um, high in anthropocentrism, low in connectedness to nature, high and high, and then low and high, low and low. So you could be, you know, any combination of low or high in these, um, across these two different dimensions. In terms of the survey method, uh, we received uh, or generated a random sample of coast residents uh, based on DMV records, so driver's license and state ID records. Pulled a random sample uh, and then invite people to do the survey. So the invitation was by mail. And we had a one week reminder and a three week reminder, so kind of a classic Dillman type approach. And people could choose to either do the survey in paper format or in, in online format, whichever uh, they preferred. 60% roughly um, completed online, um, and that's you know, more or less in line with other surveys that I've done. The response rate was 17%, which unfortunately also is not uncommon to be getting response rates around 20%. Um, it's just the, the nature of our modern era. Uh, 
Uh, but we were concerned about potential non-response bias, and so we weighted the data, and the analysis is based on that weighted data um, by age, uh, income, and geography. And the sample size for the analysis is 888. So what do we find? So starting with the very kind of simple things. Um, so current well-being uh, is variable across the different dimensions. So here we have life overall mean in the blue and a median in the orange, uh, financial, job, recreation, environment, and community. These numbers are pretty similar. I did um, about the same time, I did a, a statewide survey for a different project that included subjective well-being questions. And what we found in this survey was pretty similar for the coast region as what we found in, in that other project. So pretty comfortable with the numbers. So 80 I'm out of 100 for life overall. Financial, uh, it's no surprise to you that, um, uh, that the Oregon coast is, is fairly financially stressed, economically stressed, and that shows up in that uh, relatively low financial number. People are much uh, more contented um, with respect to recreation opportunities and, and the natural environment. Community is kind of interesting. It's, um, uh, I would have thought that might be a little bit, a bit higher. But in any case, so um, it was, People's satisfaction with the community was not as strong as their satisfaction with the environment um, or with recreation opportunities. But our main focus is on change in well-being as a result of these scenarios. Evaluation. So this is, again, these five different items. And we ask people to evaluate the current rain reserves on a, on a scale of one to seven, one being very negative to seven being very positive. And um, it's perhaps not incredibly surprising that we see some heterogeneity there. Uh, it's interesting from my perspective to document the, the degree of that. For a lot of people, um, about 50% um, for most of these dimensions, um, they said that the marine resorts basically had no impact, or they were neutral um, in terms of people's evaluation. And we have some people at the very positive end and at the very negative end tend to be more uh, negative with respect to commercial fishing and recreation uh, um, access. Um, kind of neutral, uh, roughly a net neutral for jobs, income, and community character, and a net positive with respect to conservation. Just a question. Did you, you said maybe we had about personal fishing. Right, so let me go back to the actual question um, format. So here's the question. We asked people um, how they felt about reduced opportunities for commercial charter fishing, including shellfish. And they did um, say that this is, those changes um, were either very negative to very positive. So you know, along this scale, from negative to positive. And we found in terms of the results, many people said it had no effect on them um, in their household. But, but of course, then there are some that felt it was very positive and some felt it was very negative. Any other questions about that? Can I have a question about the money? Sure. Well, you, you, know, you were saying you know, 80% is really high, 70% is really low. Those are really close. Yeah, I wouldn't say that 80% is really high. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering, are they really that different? Right, you have the standard deviations here. So, um, so in that sense, I mean, they're, right, so for example, standard deviation for job is 30. So there was really huge variability in that. Um, and I, you know, I didn't try to statistically evaluate whether or not these impaired care tests would have you, whether or not there's differences across the domain. So I just kind of look at these in general, since that's not the, the main focus. So just in terms of the pattern, you know, it's you know, just looking at this, again, without going, doing detailed analysis, so the financial and job is where people are least satisfied and to some degree the community. And the, the higher satisfaction is with environmental recreation. And the life overall is kind of interesting. So we didn't ask about things like, like you know, personal relationships in this survey or physical health, mental health, and so on. So there are some aspects and domains of life that I think are affecting life overall that we're not asking about. And those, those make sense. Like, what I was curious about, just from a scale from 0 to 100, mm -hmm. you only have to represent the 10. Yeah. That's the 
Yeah, I'd say um, I would agree with you in the sense that it's not like um, one satisfaction is double what it is in some other. Um, I guess it's kind of interesting because as when one looks at international comparisons, you know, a lot of the analysis gets down to what is across, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. You know, even like a one unit difference across countries is is seen as something that you know has some uh, should raise uh, raise awareness in people. So in that sense, um, I do notice the differences. But you're right that it's not like one is twice as high as the other. And so I think your your caution is appropriate there to say that um, we shouldn't interpret differences across these domains too strongly. Yeah. 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 On the light bulb roll, I can't see very well from here, sure, but sure. it seems like some of the questions are very spiritual. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that doesn't bias an answer rather than saying, I think the environment would be better. So that's that's a good point. So so this is a pretty standard question, and it was asked before um, these questions. So these questions in environmental worldview yeah, they were asked towards the end of the survey, so before the demographics, um, but before the um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, before the demographics, but after the questions with respect to well-being. And so um, having said that, some of the feedback that we did get from respondents is that this, um, you know, some people had a hard time identifying with this. It seems a little bit too touchy-feely for them. Um, and so um, that is a concern. So again, this was answered after they had answered the, the well-being and choice experiment ones. Um, but yeah, um, we, there is that potential concern that. Right. Um, so there's this kind of this, an aspect of social desirability bias potentially with respect to these questions. But I think your main point, if I understand correctly, is would the asking of these questions and the answering of these questions affect responses to other questions? And it's possible, but the other questions have already been answered. The ones that, is, 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 that are the focus of today's um, on the online survey, they could not. In the paper survey, they could. Uh, and so it's. You know, my um, kind of, uh, spot checking of the surveys didn't indicate that that happened. So, you know, you kind of see a pencil mark or you know, a crossed out pin mark. We didn't see that happening as, as best I can remember. I didn't do a formal evaluation, but you know, I kind of leaf through some of them. Uh, and um, so, but it is possible that that would happen on the paper survey. I mean, these questions weren't about the Right. I say, you know, um, the bigger risk is, you know, do they see these questions and then just say, well, I'm going to stop doing the rest of the survey, and that is possible. Um, and we can kind of see that in the online survey, if they just, these were towards the end of it, maybe they just did the demographics, and they wouldn't have been included in the analysis um, because we actually weighted um, the data based on demographics like age and so on. And so those people would have fallen out of the data set effectively. So there is the potential for that to happen. Um, it was not dramatic. And so we always get some item non response on income. People want to answer an income question. And to a lesser degree, age and education. So we always get some falling off. I'd have to go back and think. Um, I don't think we had a dramatic falling off as a result of these questions, but that is a possibility. Can, uh, can, you, can, you, can you tell me more what you're referring to? I don't know. I can't think of it. Okay. I so, um, but I, I would like to see education as one of the factors. Okay. Yeah, so, so that would be a good point. And actually, can we come back to that in about two slides? Um, and, and, and that's why I, I'm really glad you guys are asking these questions. And please do continue to ask them as we go along here. Um, so this is so the previous slide um, was on evaluation. This is respect with respect to preference. 
And this is green reserves and forest reserves. And we have this that the five categories right there. I'm significantly expanded, significantly reduced. We see again this diversity or heterogeneity, um, where, where there are definitely are folks that want the expansion of both folks that want the reduction, you can have a lot of people in the middle here who are kind of happy with the, the current situation. So here's um, the, uh, the kind of graphic, and you may not be able to see this very well, so let me try to talk it through. So the idea is say, you know, down here in the lower right of this graphic, we have people's choice. So we have option one, option two, or the status quo, which of those do you prefer? And we also have the subjective well-being change. So if option one happened, how would that affect your well-being? We look for how, what might affect those choices and those reports of subjective well-being change. The attributes in the scenario we would expect to be one of the predictors. So the people's choice of option one over option zero in the status quo will depend on the level of the attributes. So what's happening with respect to marine users, forest users, cost, and jobs in those options. But we want to kind of explain this heterogeneity and say, well, you know, is, is there a diversity in perspectives on the coast? And if so, what might explain that? With respect to forest reserves, so we didn't go into the level of detail on forest reserves that we did with marine reserves. And so we don't have any evaluation level. We didn't ask people to evaluate forest reserves. So the only interaction there is with environmental worldview. So which of the, the, the five clusters do they fall into? And the base is moderate. And so each of these other four takes on as a W variable. So if they're in the high-low cluster, then they have a better value one. If they're in for that variable and zero for the rest of um, the others, if they're in a low high cluster, they have a variable uh, equals one for the value equals one for that variable, and then zero for main and so on. And then the, the marine reserve evaluation, um, that interacted then with the marine reserve value. And then that marine reserve evaluation is then predicted by environmental worldview, fishing job, and people's recreation participation in marine reserves. Now, you mentioned education, and you can think about other demographics, so age and income and so on. That absolutely could be affecting each of these. So you could have education affecting environmental worldview, for example, and thus marine reserve evaluation. And statistically, you can bring it, bring it into the model anywhere, but conceptually, I would probably put it up here on the top and say it might affect environmental worldview and you know, impress some other variables. We didn't include that in the, in the evaluation. Um, but it's, it's possible that you could do that. So we see that there's diversity in environmental worldview. We didn't try to explain the cause of the predictors of that diversity in this analysis. Questions about that aspect before you continue? Great. OK, so and one concern is that these might be collinear. So there may be some relationship between environmental worldview whether you're in the function sector and the recreation that you engage in. We actually found that wasn't a problem um, based on just a simple little regression of evaluation of each of these variables. So we found that that was not problematic. We're going to talk more about that if you have an interest in that. But here are the results. So um, in this right set of columns here, we have um, the subjective well being evaluation. So it's just a path model that's indicated by that previous graphic that kind of follows that structure. And ordered mode, so it's um, um, that uh, one to five scale of um, significant reduction to significant uh, increase. And so the coefficients of significance, and the asterisk indicates uh, significance level. Two is for 0.01, and one is for 0.05. And then the these, these, two, so this, these two columns, there's the equivalent information for the choice experiment. And there it's a multinomial choice flow. And so when we look at this here, we see that um, as cost, the cost in the option increases, it becomes a less likely negative sign, uh, less likely that someone would choose an option. As the cost increases, it also uh, decreases um, the well being effect. So it could have a negative or a less positive well being effect. Jobs is positive, so the more jobs or the lower loss of jobs, uh, the more likely someone would be to choose an option, and the more positive the impact on the well being. Taking the next level then, so marine reserves, uh, you have to look at these in combination. So you have the marine reserve itself, and, and, and that, that value, so 50% decrease, is no change, zero change, 0%. 
or 50% increase. We interacted that with the evaluation term, so you have to look at these combined, um, and both of those were significant. Uh, so what we see that the interaction is important, that there is a heterogeneity. So once uh, preferences for and the well-being effect of marine reserves depends on how you evaluate uh, the current reserves. That evaluation then is based on or is affected by one's worldview, so high, low, low, high, so on, and one's recreation, uh, utilization, and fishing job. So, so in the choice here, we can see primarily the, um, in terms of specific point of one, we see the high, low, and low, high have been more impactful than the high, high, and low, low. So those people uh, who are high in anthropocentrism, who are thinking of natural resources, as being oriented towards uh, human utilization, um, um, they attempted to um, view the current evalu uh, the evaluation of the current range of reserves as negative, and that then led them to be um, less positive with respect to an increase in reserves, more supportive of decrease. The reverse is true for people who have low ethnocentrism and high economic in nature. They had a more positive evaluation of the current reserves, and that then led to a stronger preference for increases in the reserve, and also more likely to have a positive well-being effect on the increase in reserves. So the signs in the, in the in broad terms relative magnitude are the same across the choice model and the well-being model. So high, high tend to be positive and low, low positive as well, um, but all, only at 0.05 and, and the coefficient magnitudes a little bit lower. The main point is, is that there is heterogeneity in, in evaluation, which then explains heterogeneity in choice and well-being effects, and environmental worldview helps um, predict that heterogeneity in evaluation. We find that one's recreation patterns also help predict. So if you are engaged in coast recreation, so walking the beach, for example, or watching whales, you tend to be more positive in your evaluation. If you are a recreational fisher or other ocean-oriented activity, you tend to be more negative. And if you work in the uh, fishing sector, you tend to be more negative. So this means that that would negatively affect one's evaluation and then negatively affect your preference for additional marine reserves. And the same general pattern with respect to... A couple of questions. Yeah, and go for it. it. It's really more about the way that you're characterizing uh -huh. a number of different things uh -huh. that makes me wonder about potential bias. Um, when you talk about the group that is, anthropo uh, is anthropocentric oriented mm -hmm. towards their view of nature mm -hmm. versus those that are connectedness mm -hmm. to nature, yeah, I, I just sort of have to wonder. I mean, somebody who's out there mm -hmm. in the field mm -hmm. every day doing things, mm -hmm. maybe making a living by harvesting, mm -hmm. you view as anthropocentric in nature and high in that particular thing versus one, I mean, it sounds like from what you've said, and versus somebody who, you know, might be sitting in the lotus position going um, <laughs> and um, you know feels that they are very connected to the world mm -hmm. through that is in in the view presented connected to nature mm -hmm. that seems a biased uh, way of characterizing those Okay, so let me clarify, because how you conveyed it is not my intent for how I want to convey it. So first of all, in terms of activity, um, one of the points is that um, this is worldview, and we do not assume that people with a specific um, employment uh, or sector have a particular worldview. So that's actually part of the reason for evaluating this separately. So here's whether or not you work in the fishing sector as one self-reports it here's one's worldview, and they can be completely independent of each other. So how correlated were they? Um, well, I'll just go to that slide and show you. So these are just the extra slides. So this is, I think, what answers your question here. So um, here are people that are, do not report primary employment and fishing, the no column. 
here's people that do, and here's in the cluster membership. And I think the most the most noticeable difference to me is down here in the high A, low C, low A, high C. So those employed in the fishing sector report based on their responses to those survey statements. Um, they fall into the high anthropocentrism, low connectedness to nature um, uh, category in terms of 19%. But 14% fall into low anthropocentrism, high connectedness to nature. And we have a lot of people that fall into high for both. So part of the reason to have these two dimensions is, I think, from my perspective, to get at what you're getting at, I think, is to say that we don't assume that if you're highly connected to nature, you are then ecocentric and vice versa. So essentially, so, you're clustering in a square like this, right? And they're essentially in, the, in one of those four quadrants, because yeah. you could characterize it as low, high, high, low. Yeah. So there's four quadrants? Well, but not equal size quadrants. There's four clusters. There's actually five clusters. You have the moderate. So group. I'd like to see those data coordinated. Do you have that um, slide? We, we don't have that. We, um, so I guess the, the question is, uh, is, your, is the question whether or not people, um, so let me just say that these two variables, anthropocentrism and connectedness to nature, if you look at the factor analysis pattern, they're not completely orthogonal. So that's, that's kind of my point here is that you can have some different combinations. So I think your point is if we had four quadrants, where would everybody fall? I don't have that slide here. I have not done that analysis. We could do that. My, I think my point is, is that we have to get away from the, uh, well, I guess I would say I agree with you in the sense that my intention is not to fall into the uh, sort of uh, allocation where people are either or, but people can have different combinations. And so that's, from my perspective, why we have these two dimensions is to say we're not assuming that because you're high in one, you're low in the other, you're the other way around. You can be high in both or low in both. And we're also not assuming that because you work in a particular industry that you're fall into one cluster or the other. So this shows, to my reading, is that there is a little bit of a pattern here, but this is not a statistically significant relationship. So if you do a cross-tab and, and chi-square on this, th this is nowhere near statistically significant. So again, it shows that one's worldview is independent of one's um, se the, the sector in which one works. To me in itself, that's kind of interesting because if we do have those stereotypes, this is suggesting our stereotypes may be wrong, um, that we see some diversity within different employment sectors. So I, I, I'm glad you asked that question because I want to clarify that you know, what may be coming across from what I say is not my intention, but I think my, my perspective, I think, is similar to yours, that we don't want to kind of pigeonhole people. Does that make sense? Sir? Yeah. yeah. What was the end here? Uh, so uh, the end is 888. No, no, no. People are employed in fishing. Um, that was relatively small. It was a fairly small percentage, yeah. Um, so. That was just based on who responded to the survey. So, so are we talking 20 people? In that ballpark, yeah. Yeah, it's fairly small. We had more folks in natural, other natural resources, which could be you know, logging, farming, and so on. Um, but the terms, in terms of the number of commercial fishers, it was relatively small. And do you consider people that are involved in the recreational fishing industry as part of that? Uh, so if they are charter fishers, so if they have a charter boat, yep, uh, they would be included in that. So let me. How about if they own a bait shop or a uh, fishing supply shop? So this would be where they could categorize themselves as commercial charter other fishing, fishing or other fishing related okay. employment. But again, we didn't define that. And mm -hmm. so, sure. you know, we, yeah. we left it up to people sure. to, to make that judgment. Yeah. Two questions. But yeah. Would you, would you say that like the number of commercial fisheries people that responded is like a decent proportion of the number of commercial fisher people that are like in Oregon? Because I don't really know what that number is. Yeah. Maybe 20 was a decent <coughs> proportion of them. Yeah, so I would frame it a little bit differently. I wouldn't focus on what's, well, I guess you could frame it that way, but then say, is everybody else a decent proportion of the overall population? The way I would frame it is, is the percentage of respondents in the sample who gave this response um, similar to what's really out there. So is our sample representative yeah. of the population with respect to the employment variable? The challenge is, is coming up with those numbers. Um, and because we, we asked OED and we looked at other sources of information, um, and we, you know, 
we didn't get a really clear cut, cut number of what percentage of all coastal residents um, really do fall into this category. So first of all, we had about, I forgot the exact number, but a, a large percentage are not in paid employment. So there's a lot of retirees on the coast and, and people otherwise not in paid employment. So that's quite a large category. Um, and then we also, had, you know, <coughs> amongst the rest, we had a lot of professional services and, you know, and, and other categories. We looked for um, some sense of how this would match up with, again, the population on the coast. But this is the challenge, is that um, we didn't um, follow like an OED classification and ask people to kind of self-classify the way OED would classify or, or use NAICS codes or anything like that. So um, it was kind of difficult for us to say how representative or unrepresentative this was with respect to fishers. So then the, I think the more relevant question is, is um, are the fishers who responded to this question, people who did indicate primary in these two categories, are they representative of the broader industry on the coast? That is really difficult to, to judge. Um, and I, I don't have the answer to that. So we may be biased um, you know, in that regard, just basically non-response bias. Um, or there could be some coverage issues. I mean, if for some reason, fishers who are um, part-time residents in Oregon, part-time in other states, don't have a DMV um, driver's license, or, Oregon DMV, or ID, then they wouldn't have been in our, in our sampling frame. So there could be some coverage error. Um, so there, there, there are those possibilities. The, main, the biggest concern would be, are those who responded and, and self-classified in this group different from others who really are in this group on the, in the population? And I don't have the answer to that. Yeah. Do you remember your average age of respondents? Uh, I do have that. I don't remember it off the top of my head. But a large number are in um, the retiree side. That's not unusual for surveys. Um, young people tend to be underrepresented in surveys. We did weight based on that. Uh, and so, you know, so we can, you know, compensate with respect to age, but we don't know if, if those that are in the, in the sample may differ as an age-related variable. So we can only you know, measure age, we can't measure their attitude in terms of some census reference point. So. But yeah, so in general, our sample was older um, than the population, and we waited <coughs> to adjust for that. Good questions. I have another one. Go for it. Yeah. Um, you, as I recall, you had a, a broad suite of things that you had people evaluate uh -huh. relative to marine reserves themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And yet you took simply one average value to characterize the, their attitude. Is that, did I get that correct? Um, yeah, I would say. Um, so I would call it an evaluation, perhaps more than an attitude, but, but yeah, so we had those five items right. and we took the mean um, rather than say factor scores or and we could have treated it as a latent variable with each of those five as indicators. But basically we said, um, we asked people to evaluate the reserves with respect to these five aspects. Right. We had an open-ended question below that and said, are there any other ways beyond these in which the marine reserves have affected you? And if so, can you describe them? But that was open and qualitative, which sure. we could not easily right. incorporate into the model. I just have to wonder about the, the you know, condensing that all into one average value. Mm -hmm. I mean, being a biologist, uh -huh. you know, you, you know that a whale can't live on the average mm -hmm. amount of plankton mm -hmm. in the water, if it's mm -hmm. a plankton feeder, right? A bird can't soar on the average of if air is moving up or down. Mm -hmm. Things live in the extremes. Yeah. So we absolutely could evaluate that. So one, we could evaluate that separately with, with respect to each of these five. We also, so we treated this basically as an interval variable. We could create categories and say, are you here at the high end, here at the low end, or somewhere in between. And if you're, if I'm understanding you correctly, maybe it's most interesting to look at extremes and see if they have more predictive power. Uh, and so perhaps you re, uh, create groups, you know, from this interval. Might be worth examining. Yeah, at least we could do that. So I, I don't mean to interrupt. No, go for <laughs> it. You should probably be allowed to finish your talk. But yeah. I just have just a really quick question on uh -huh. this one. It might just be getting confused. The, those two first ones that start with the word reduced, uh -huh. how would you answer those? A negative reduction or a positive 
So we tried to stress that this is, we're trying to um, describe here some um, more or less objective changes. Um, so this is kind of a physical reality um, or policy reality, what, what have you. And then we asked people to, to just report how they felt about these changes. We wrestled with this question quite a bit. And I'm not going to assert it's the perfect question, um, but we did try to separate out the physical directional changes on the ground, as it were, from how people evaluated those changes. And so people could evaluate a reduced fishing, up, you know, redu reduction of fishing opportunities as either negative, neutral, or, or positive. Um, so it could be negative in a directional practical sense, but evaluated either positively or negatively. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I always have to overanalyze questions. No, it's good. But yeah, but I think it's good to do that. And the other thing is, these are difficult topics for respondents to think through as well. So I think what you're wrestling with, some respondents are wrestling with, and this is actually perhaps one of the easier aspects. You know, I think when you get to the choice and the um, and, and the, well, the well-being, that gets even more difficult because you've got four different things moving, and you have to kind of evaluate them and so on. So I think that these, you know, the questions you guys are asking are really good questions. Okay, so we're at time, so um, feel free to mosey along if you, if you want to, but I'll go ahead and, um, and wrap up here. So forest reserves, uh, a similar kind of story. We didn't have the evaluation level, um, but we had a similar kind of pattern where environmental worldview did affect um, one's preferences, how they responded to the forest reserve uh, attribute. Okay, conclusion. So part of some kind of methodological uh, aspects, I'll touch on that briefly. So methodologically, it seems to me that, um, from my perspective, contingent subjective well-being is kind of a natural extension of uh, stated pr preference uh, approaches used in non-market valuation. But there have been very few applications. I mentioned the Benjamin et al. studies, um, but this is really kind of new stuff in, in, in a way, to use a technical term. Um, so the, the method definitely remains exploratory. So uh, half of people said that there would be some change in their well-being in response to the vignettes, which means, of course, that half didn't. So no effect. And, and of course, well, not of course, but what we found is many respondents were not aware of the uh, marine resource. So we had a one to four scale of awareness. Uh, about roughly half the people were in the, the lower two categories of not aware or slightly aware. So a lot of people were not aware of the marine reserves. We have other uh, aspects as well. So consequentiality, the idea here is that if we're going to ask people to respond to these scenarios, uh, in an ideal world, we could say your responses will guide policy. So there's a consequence to your responses. And that, in principle, would make the um, respondents take the task seriously and respond truthfully. Uh, we couldn't tell people that your responses will drive policy with respect to marine reserves or forest reserves. That's just not realistic. You know, that, that's a matter for, um, for folks beyond myself and, and even ODFW. Um, so consequentiality was an issue. Uh, you know, if the method, you know, so in some cases, so for example, um, Bishop and colleagues did a study on the, um, uh, the BP oil spill in the Gulf, looking at natural resource damage assessment. They did in-person interviews because that would lead to potentially lead to multi-billion dollar damage assessment um, in in, um, in that context, and so you know in that you know really high uh, impact con uh, context, you know they invested you know quite significant budget to doing in-person interviews. So there's you know some methodological issues that you know, it's just the reality of the work that we're doing in the context that um, that there are some limitations there. Uh, choices and choice model coefficients were, were broadly but not perfectly consistent. I can go into that if you have an interest in it. Um, the limitation there is that this is a within subjects design, so people answered both of those. Uh, again, in an ideal world, we would have split the sample in half and said half the people get the choice experiment and half the uh, subjective well-being. But that means we would have half as many um, observations of each, or we could have doubled the budget and done that, which wasn't going to happen. So, uh, so we had that limitation. Benjamin and all also had that limitation. So it's not unusual, but that might err in terms of uh, leading to a greater um, consistency. So from my perspective, you know, this is um, you know, kind of an uh, important and interesting uh, evaluation. But 
uh, as we look ahead, uh, there's this balance between the task salience. So keeping in mind that for a lot of people, they didn't really know much about the marine reserves, so it may not have been highly salient to them. And task complexity is a fairly complex task in terms of what we ask them to do. Uh, it can, it's possible to make it a bit simpler. You just get less information by doing that. So that's part of evaluating these tasks. This Johnson et al., this is a, you know, basically a follow-up to the NOAA Blue Ribbon Panel that came out of the Exxon Valdez oil spill um, damage assessment process. Uh, and so you know, they've been, economists have been working on state of preference techniques for a few decades now and really refining the, the technique. So the well-being approach is much newer. And my argument is that you know, we should be doing that type of evaluation that, you know, that you see in the economics literature before. Um, you know, there needs to be more of that groundwork and evaluation done. And with respect to the substantive aspect uh, of the particular attributes there, um, again, the choice experiment provides some indication of preference and, and willingness to pay. Um, the contingent subjective well-being provides an indication of uh, expected or anticipated subjective well-being effects. From my perspective, the most interesting aspect is you know, thinking about heterogeneity. So it's not surprising that there's heterogeneity. At the same time, there's not a lot of evaluation. So there was that you know, Walmo and um, Edwards study in the Northeast I mentioned, um, and people recognize there's heterogeneity, but there's not a lot of empirical evaluation. So from my perspective, I'm hoping that this adds a little bit to the, to the literature and to the discussion about what might be sources of heterogeneity. So employment is, is an obvious potential uh, factor. Non-commercial use of an area, so recreational use is a potential factor. But there may be other things, whether it be worldview or demographics, that might affect some of those variables. References, if you're interested. And thank you. And any more questions? <laughs>